I am here with John Randine, the always excited John Randine, as we have lots of news to jump into. Kicking off with Bellator kickboxing. John, we saw Spike very much get attached to kickboxing through Glory. They went their separate ways. Glory now on ESPN and also working with Fight Pass. And they're going at it from a different angle this time with Scott Coker's vision of kickboxing. Do you like this idea by Spike? And is this going to be viable this time around? It is 100%. Uh, just if you think about when Bellator first started going, you know, people... There are many people out there that said, nobody's ever going to want to be a Bellator fighter. The goal is to get to the UFC. That's the pinnacle. But if you hang around long enough and you create a, a market and you create a destination for your viewers, clearly with when it comes to Bellator, Spike is uh, their broadcast partner. Let's just keep building things here. If we remember, Scott Coker was the first person to promote K1 fights in North America. He has a kickboxing background. He understood that you know, Spike just had to be in for the long haul when it came to glory. They weren't willing to do that for whatever reason. Coker uh, believes and understands that if, the, again, I keep calling the casual fans, Fight Network fans, you're not the casual fans. You understand you're the hardcores. Yeah, t-shirt. So, uh, it's wear. true. But, uh, but Coker understands that, you know, people want to see, don't necessarily want to see the ground game if you're not into that. They want to see knockouts and Glory or K1, now Bellator uh, kickboxing, they're going to provide that. And I think the luxury that Coker has is that he has fighters that are going to that are going to be able to do both. You've got a guy like Paul Daly or Joe Schilling. They'll be able to fit the role, fill the role of both kickboxer and mixed martial arts uh, combatant. I think this is a fantastic move for the Bellator organization, and we're going to see the brand continue to grow. When you look at what, what Glory attempted to do, I mean, those that watch the cards pretty much had pretty strong reviews yeah. of the actual fights. And there you see the, the Joe Schillings of the world that were able to compete on a major platform. But the audience didn't follow suit. What needs to be done differently? Is this finding stars, having the Bellator model of you're gonna take celebrity fighters in, in the sense that they have a lot of name recognition that it might be train wreck television. Is that going to be the direction here to, to get people's interest? Because on the surface, you think that kickboxing would have this wide audience, but that thus far, that wasn't the case on no, Spike yeah, with Glory. Again, you just have to be in for the long haul. You have to develop this. You have to develop your own stars. It's just like what uh, Strike Force did in the past and now Bellator. You know, Coker was handed this whole situation. He's like, okay, I have my specific brand of mixed martial arts that people are used to seeing. And he's good at scouting top talent. Luke Rockhold was his champion. Robbie Lawler was there. Nick Diaz was there. Cain Velasquez, Daniel Cormier, all these guys fought for the Strike Force brand. Coker understands what sells and what's gonna entertain people. The goal now is to, yes, attach yourself to some of the old guards, because if you put Quentin Rampage Jackson in a bunch of kickboxing, glo and kickboxing gloves or Paul Daly versus Vanderlei Silva in a kickboxing match, I guarantee the mixed martial arts fans are going to tune in as well as the kickboxing fans. And then you have to give something to the kick for kickboxing fans. You're going to also have to give them something they're going to want to tune into. It's not just the, these MMA fighters that are strap strapping on the bigger gloves. You have to give them world-class talent as well. And I know that Bellator will do their best to go out and try to bring in those, uh, those types of fighters. And we're going to see the first version of this April 16th for the card in Italy already attaching some names including Patricky Pitbull Freite and I think you're going to see a lot of that. Benson Henderson has say, stated yeah. his willingness to do kickboxing would not stun me if Quentin Jackson were to do this as well. I mean Quentin Jackson how many times has this guy complained about the wrestling element mm -hmm. of mixed martial arts. Okay Quentin here is your you avenue one. that you can you can now fight uh, over on kickboxing. You're still going to be on spike. There's a big opportunity here for a lot of fighters and and I think that this tells you more than anything how Spike, they are completely subscribing to Scott Coker's method. They love his vision, and I think they are both on the same page where it was very different when it was Bjorn Rebney and Spike mm -hmm. and trying to present two different versions of Bellator. Exactly, and I, you, you look at what Coker's trying to do. He's just trying to entertain people. He's trying to put people in the seats. He's trying to get ratings. And one of the ways you do that is by telling stories. Of course, you bring in stars. But he also tell some of these other stories. And what a better story than having the wife of Gilbert Melendez, Carrie Melendez, in kickboxing action. She was a former Strike Force champion, and it kind of writes itself. You, you look at her here, uh, she know th this is one of those interesting stories where you hear fighters say, Well, I have to be selfish. I need I need a partner that can understand. Well, Carrie Melendez, she has been through it, and vice versa. She can get ready for her fights knowing that her husband has been there many times and he knows exactly what an athlete needs. So I think uh, Coker's doing a great thing. 
And I think that uh, he's satisfied with where Bellator is. He's like, okay, there's a number one organization out there. There is clearly room for a healthy number two, and we believe the Bellator is that organization. I can't say I disagree. All right, let's move on to a recent contract re-signing by the UFC. Uh, Jeremy Botter was noting this. Dustin Poirier, whose deal expired with the UFC after the Joseph Duffy win earlier this year, he has re-signed with the UFC. I think that this is one that obviously makes a whole lot of sense for Dustin Poirier to stick there. Training with, with ATT, and this is somebody that I feel has had, uh, it's, it's been a much improved Dustin Poirier since his return to the lightweight division. Yeah, it's funny because uh, we were talking about the whole situation uh, with uh, Dustin Poirier when he turned down the replacement after Joe Duff Duffy couldn't compete and people were on this guy. Oh, you know, he's got to take this fight. But this isn't the old Dustin Poirier. You know, the landscape of mixed martial arts has changed. And these fighters have to think about the future. And Dustin Poirier, I know, came under criticism for that decision. But look what happened. He ended up getting that victory. And he, re he signs a, contact, a contract extension with the UFC. And now he has the luxury to be able to go back. I know he says he doesn't want to ever fight at 145 pounds. But you're telling me a title shot came, uh, came his way at 145 pounds. He's going to take it. But I think that he's, he's a brand that uh, the fans are going to continue to watch because his fighting style, I think, dazzles everybody. Yeah, I think that this is one that, I mean, a very appealing fighter that if you're an outside organization, probably having some interest in. Yep. And with the UFC clearly valuing someone of Dustin Poirier's level. I think, that, I think some of the recent resignings tell you a lot about the mentality of both promotions right now. The fact that the UFC doubled down on Aljamain Sterling and ultimately wanted him for their future re-signing the likes of a Dustin Poirier, which seems a, an obvious one to me, and Alistair Overeem, convincingly as well, the fact that Bellator, looking at Quinton Jackson as someone they're not just willing to give up and aggressively going after a Benson Henderson. You're seeing very much through these signings what is the philosophy of these two promotions in 2016. Yeah, and what it, what it, to me, what it says for the entire landscape of mixed martial arts is you need competition. You would need competition in order for the products to get better and to have that viable number two is really going to level that playing field. A man that might be entering the free agent market in the not too distant future is the current World Series of Fighting Bantamweight champion Marlon Marais. He will be defending his title on Saturday night, part of World Series of Fighting 28's card, which will be airing here in Canada on Fight Network. And here's a closer look at Saturday night's event. Coming up on February 20th, World Series of Fighting will touch down at Next Level Sports Complex in Garden Grove, California, and the promotion is set to showcase one of their most talented fighters, as Bantamweight King Marlon Moraes will be hunting for his 11th straight victory when he battles unheralded 12-1 fighter Joseph Barajas. The Brazilian Moraes, a teammate of former UFC champion Frankie Edgar, is quietly establishing himself as one of the best fighters not fighting on the big stage. After a rough start to his mixed martial arts career, where he posted a 5-4-1 record, the 27-year-old would prove his potential with a split decision win over former WEC champion Miguel Torres in his debut with the company. Over his next seven fights, the Ricardo Almeida BJJ Brown Belt would dazzle viewers with his ability to take the contest wherever he needed to. Head kick KOs, crushing submissions, or grueling five-round wars are what are to be expected when trying to decipher the Marias code. Marias takes control of the positions he can, always taking it to the man standing in way of a triumph. Can the California-based fighter Barajas be the man to capture gold from the champion and only his second fight for the organization? In his debut for the promotion, Barajas would earn his second victory in a row when he dispatched 4-4 four four combatant Eric Villalobos by third-round TKO to find himself fighting for World Series of Fighting Gold. Barajas, too, has finished many of his adversaries in a multitude of ways, and his lone blemish was a submission loss to current UFC fighter Serwin Kakai. Fans can catch all the action right here on FN. Check all of your listings for details. All right, so Marlon Marias looking for his 11th consecutive victory takes on Joseph Barajas. And in the case of Marias, he's in a very similar position to Bibiano Fernandez, who is a bantamweight that makes a lot of good money, but the price of all that is that it is on a smaller platform. And Marlon Marias, I think when his contract comes due, that's going to be an interesting one as well. But this is somebody that has really become one of the flagship fighters for World Series of Fighting that has come up through that promotion. And you can say as someone that they have, they have cultivated within that system and you get to see him on Saturday night. A hundred percent. Just like Justin Gaethje, this is a guy that you believe can hang with some of the best 135-pound fighters 
in the world. You just see his creativity. He has this finisher's mentality. He fights the smart game. Sometimes he, he gets himself in, in dangerous positions, but he always finds a way out of it. It's, he's always thinking offense. And to have Frankie Edgar uh, as a teammate in your corner, constantly giving you advice, uh, Marlon Moraes, Definitely one to look out for, and you guarantee if World Series of Fighting does not renew this guy's contract, he is certainly going to end up in either Bellator or the UFC. That card's also going to feature Tamor Valiev, who's a really watch hot him. prospect to watch, taking on Chris Gutierrez, and you would have to imagine the winners of both fights would be the championship fight you'd be looking to make coming out of World Series of Fighting 28. But Marlon Marias, I think most people heavily favoring him in this particular fight. Barajas is in it, is the biggest deep. fight of his career, and this is an opportunity for him, but I think Marlon Marias, there is a clear distinction in, in talent at this stage of the game. Yeah, I, I feel bad. I think that you're going to see another outstanding performance and Brajas is not going to be able to handle the pressure of, of the Brazilian. He's just going to push it constantly, and you don't know what's coming your way because he's so creative. He'll do spinning attacks. He'll go high. He'll go low. If he gets in close, he'll attack there. If the fight goes down to the ground there, he's not just thinking about getting back, getting back to his feet. He will try to dispatch you anywhere. Look, as he, as he lands a punch, he tries to take your back and immediately going for the submission. This is a remarkable athlete, and uh, I can't wait to watch, this, uh, watch him in action. Should be fun. It's going to be airing Saturday night here on Fight Network in Canada. You can watch that and in the U.S. It, of course, will be airing on NBCSN. And on a weekend where we have Bellator World Series of UFC and UFC, they all have their own night. Yeah, Imagine that's, that's that. Awesome. Next weekend, though, the UFC will be back in London, England. And one of the men competing on the main card is UFC welterweight undefeated Tom Breeze. And earlier this week, this man, John Randy, got a chance to speak with the undefeated welterweight. And here is a portion of that chat. I think my, my whole game, you know, I'm, you know, I, I balance out my training every day. I'm doing some sort of grappling uh, or, or boxing training or striking training, you know. So I feel like I've improved my whole game, you know. But um, uh, since my last fight, I've definitely made a, a lot of improvements, you know. I've been I, like I sparred Lucien Butte for his uh, last fight with James Degal, you know. I go I go train at Henzo Grace with John Danahar also, you know, and also the training with Ferraz and Eric O'Keefe at TriStar. So I'm always looking to make big improvements. That was Tom Breeze. That full interview is coming your way later on in the hour, but he draws Kita Nakamura next weekend on the main card in London, England. Tom Breeze, whose teammate Alex Garcia will also be competing this weekend. Tom Breeze is someone that I think everyone is starting to kind of hone in on and, and focus. Here's a, an undefeated fighter, a lot of upside, training at a, a very well-regarded gym in TriStar, and this is the next step up for him, and I think somebody that we'll be watching over the next year. Oh, he's a vicious finisher. Uh, we've had the luxury to show a number of his fights in the Bama organization, as well as Cage Warriors, and he is super slick. If he's battering, if he's standing, he's battering you from the outside, making you pay for coming in. Again, if, he, uh, if this fight goes down to the ground, he is vicious on the ground. He will try to lock up some sort of triangle choke or a rear naked choke. He is uh, definitely a welterweight to keep your eye on. And, and he said uh, he believes that he will be the first British champion. And uh, it's exciting to think about his future. Yep, and that card is going to be headlined by another Brit in Michael Bisping taking on Anderson Silva, and that will be airing here on Fight Network next Saturday, February the 27th. Now, earlier this week, we talked about the allegations that have been made public against BJ Penn. The UFC released a statement that we read here, and they are postponing booking BJ Penn on an upcoming fight card while this investigation plays itself out. BJPenn.com has posted their own statement, and we're going to read that as well. Quote, the allegations that Pedro and and his girlfriend are making against BJ Penn simply aren't true. Penn trusted Pedro to run his website for almost a decade and considered him family. He was fired last year for unethical behavior and was provided a severance that ended on February 16, 2016. One day later, allegations appeared in a one-sided Twitter rant, which happened to be many months after the alleged date in question, which was August of last summer. There are many holes in Pedro's story. In the almost 15 years that Penn has been a champion fighter, there has not ever been any incident or allegation in regards to his conduct with women. He is a family man and father of two young daughters with a known long-term girlfriend. It is unfortunate that someone that BJ considered family is trying to extort.
extort him, end quote. So I think it's only fair that uh, BJ Penn's side is, is also read out, and this investigation is ongoing. There's a pending one in Hilo, Hawaii, but as of right now, the UFC is kind of putting BJ Penn on ice, which is probably the responsible thing to do while this plays itself out, and and go from there if you're the UFC. Not much more you can say that's, about it. That's it. There's literally nothing you can do about this situation, especially if the police are involved. Let them have their investigation. And, of course, there'll be evidence that uh, comes to light down the road. So we'll keep our eye on this. We mentioned it earlier. Michael Bisping and Anderson Silva, they are meeting on Saturday, February the 27th. The pre-show airing here on Fight Network kicks off at 3 p.m. Eastern time, followed by the fights airing here in Canada on Fight Network. Spend your whole day with John, myself, and Robin Black.